I am going to suggest rather arbitrarily that we need to distinguish the ancient world picture from the normative world view of the Bible. Those terms could mean different things to different people. Here's how I'm using them. The world picture is the visualization of the cosmology, which perhaps was the science of its day in ancient times. And I'm going to suggest that we need to distinguish that from the enduring values and theological claims the text is making on our lives. That's the world view. Now, you know, there's German Weltbild and Weltanschauung, that's the root of those two conceptions. You, you don't have to use the terminology there. But there's something important in that distinction. Let me illustrate it this way. The creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2 have very different cosmologies or conceptions of the world or world pictures. The signal is there are different names for God used in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 calls God Elohim, the, the standard word for God in the Old Testament. It's a plural noun, the plural of El, the word for a God. God, the plural noun just gets translated God, capital G in our Bibles. But in Genesis 2, and it really starts at verse 4, the, the, the second creation account, God is called Yahweh Elohim, consistently. So that's a clue. But let's look now at the different styles, scope, and organizational principles of Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1, you have the creation of the entire cosmos over six days with repetition and patterning. One biblical scholar, Sean McEvin, who says the closest thing to that is children's nursery rhymes. It's almost like a teaching technique, this repetitive patterning. He uses the, the little red hen to show the stylistic uh, patterning of Genesis 1. And he doesn't mean that in, any, in a put-down way. He loves the text. It climaxes with God's, with the creation of humans on the sixth day and then God resting. But Genesis 2 has a more straightforward narrative with persona in conflict, which is what a narrative really is. And it focuses not on the cosmos, but on the creation of human beings. If you think that's not enough difference between the two conceptions, look up at the different evaluations of stages of creation. In Genesis 1, six times God saw that it was good, and once that it was very good. In Genesis 2, when God makes man, he says, it's not good that the man should be alone. You don't find that language in Genesis 1. Different world conceptions. Same enduring theological claim. No contradiction at that level, in my opinion. There's also a different initial state of the world. In Genesis 1, the world is covered in water. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. God has to separate the waters to bring forth dry land. Genesis 2 starts with dry land, dry wilderness. Problem, there's no water, it says. Very different world picture. There's also a different ordering of events. Let's take Genesis 2. We start with dry land, then a stream comes and waters the land. Then God puts a man uh, there. Then he plants a garden for the man to tend. That's plants. Then he makes animals and brings them to the man. Then he makes a woman and brings, him, brings her to the man. Genesis 1, first there's water. Then the water is separated so dry land will appear. Plants appear on dry land, then animals, then humans, male, female, together. And most likely it's not two individuals, it's the human race as a group. Very different world picture. I think no contradiction at the level of worldview. Which of those two creation accounts is literally true? Very important question. Which one is literally true? Why do Christians tend to privilege Genesis 1 over Genesis 2 as if one was literally true, the other wasn't? Do these two creation accounts contradict each other? If a literal reading of Genesis 1 contradicts modern science, as some Christians say, then it also contradicts Genesis 2. So we need to clarify what we mean by literal. I want to propose that some ancient biblical editor under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit put Genesis 1 and 2 side by side. Therefore, despite their differences of world picture, there's no fundamental contradiction of worldview. They're making the same theological claims. This means, third thesis, that attention to the ancient world picture is the only root we have to the text's normative worldview. We're going to have to understand the world picture. We need, first of all, a literal reading of the text. I, I really think that. See, literal comes from the idea of according to the letter, ad literam, 
literary and literal originally have the same meaning. I want to pay attention to exactly what it says. Does it say six days? Yes, it does. Let's not make it say anything else. It says six days. The question is, what do we do with that? We need to pay attention to how Genesis 1 portrays the world and God and their creation. But we need a contextual reading of Genesis 1 because the question is, what do the words actually mean? How are we going to recover what the ancient author intended? Are our contemporary conceptions of the world normative for interpreting Genesis? I don't think so. We need to therefore combine a close literary reading of the text with investigation of the background symbolic world that the text lives and breathes in, which involves the canonical context, that is the rest of scripture, particularly other biblical texts that would shed light on Genesis 1. No text is an island. We've got to read intertextually. That's most of what I'm going to do tonight. And secondly, we've got to look at the ancient historical context. What were the ideas that Genesis 1 was addressing? Before we can ask, how can Genesis 1 address our issues, we have to understand what issues it was addressing. Maybe that's all very basic. So let's get down to the content. I want to propose two overlapping world pictures or metaphors which intertwine in this text. We need to understand these pictures to grasp the worldview. The first is creation as God's temple. And the second is creation as God's kingdom. I'm going to spend more time, I think, on creation as God's temple than on the kingdom. This is a wisely constructed world. That's a fundamental theme in biblical creation texts. So, for example, in Psalm 104, 24, the psalmist recognizes that the world is really wisely made, full of God's creatures, great and small. And in Psalm 139, 14, he says, And you've made me fearfully and wonderfully. There's wisdom in this world. It's an amazing world. Whether you look out or you look within, it's a wisely constructed world. In fact, in Proverbs 8, wisdom says, speaking, personified, I was brought into being by God before the world was made. Before he had made anything, he conceived me. He birthed me. Which, metaphorically, I think that means God came up with a pretty good plan. He birthed wisdom. And then wisdom said, I was there when he made the world. And wisdom says, I was God's master craftsman as he made the world. That's a metaphor which gets stated a little more specifically in the Job 28 text, which is in the next line, that at the end of Job 28, the poet says, nobody can find wisdom. It's really hard to find. It's not in the deep. It's not in the heights. But God knows the way to wisdom because when he made the world, He had wisdom before himself as a model. He tested it and proved it and embedded it in the created order. But it's hard for us to find, that poet admits. But wisdom is embedded in creation. This is actually very similar to Mesopotamian creation myths. In particular, the Numa Elish, the so-called Babylonian creation epic. Because the god Marduk there creates both the cosmos and human beings as what he calls Niklatu in the Akkadian language, artful works or ingenious contrivances. They're full of wisdom. In fact, when Marduk's father, the god of wisdom, Ea, heard what Marduk planned, he was amazed. What an astounding job. The Bible says something similar to that. Don't get choked up about that. We're going to see how the Bible descends from the Mesopotamian milieu in just a moment. Now, as I'm going through, I want to say that if something I say doesn't make sense, you need clarification, I'm I'm quite willing to stop and clarify. But content questions and you know disputing everything I say, wait till the end, then we can have a good raucous discussion. But if you need clarification, interrupt me at any point. Okay, what was God making when he created the world? Well take a look at Proverbs twenty four. I've marked a few of these texts. I want to read this to you. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Knowledge, sorry, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. In Hebrew, chokhmah, tevuna, and da'at. God, in other words, any any building is built through this kind of wisdom. And it is filled with all kinds of beautiful things. The model of a house is a structure with filling. 
That helps us understand Genesis 1. Turn the page over to page 3. You see a, a chart there. Starting in the 18th century, biblical scholars, and they all, every commentary on Genesis 1 will have some version of this chart. Biblical scholars have noticed that there is a structure to Genesis 1. On the first three days of creation, God creates, creates regions or categories or spaces or realms. We could say that's the building God has made. On the next three days, God fills each of those realms with occupants or inhabitants that appropriately dwell there. So, having created light and separated from darkness, God puts the luminaries, the light-bearing bodies in the sky. Days one and four correlate. Having separated the water down here from the water above with a, an air bubble and what's called the firmament from the Latin firmamentum, kind of a hard dome to push back water. Not our cosmology. We don't think that we're living in an air bubble with water all around. Quite different. That's how they conceived it. Then God puts things to fly in the air bubble and things to, to live in the water down here. So days two and, and five correlate. On day three, God separates water, lets dry land appear, puts grass growing on it. Day six, land animals and humans come to live on the dry land. There is an architectonic plan, a scheme. God has worked this out very well. It may not be our conception of creation, but it is a wise conception. It's developmental, it is well planned, and it is a, the world is a habitable universe where creatures can dwell in safety. That's fundamental to how the Bible understands creation. So Proverbs 3, 19 to 20 is an interesting example because this occurs earlier in the book, same book of Proverbs that said a building is built by wisdom, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Here we're told that when God made the world, he used wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to create the world. The world has a certain similarity to a building. Now, if you're shocked by that, uh, it means you haven't read anything in ancient Near Eastern studies, because in the entire ancient Near East, the world is conceived of as a building. Kind of standard. Everybody thought that. The Bible wasn't unique on that. This is a building that we inhabit. There's a, a roof overhead. The mountains are the pillars holding up the roof. There's the ground we live on. Isn't it nice? It's a safe place to live. It's a model. It's a picture. What are the enduring values of that, is the other question. Now, if you know your New Testament in the King James Version, not in the NIV, or the NRS in the King James, you will know the phrase, the foundations of the world. The lamb slain before the foundations of the world. The modern translations say before the beginning of the world, or the creation of the world. The metaphor is a dead metaphor in the New Testament. But there are about a half a dozen times when the phrase, the foundation of the world, is used. It's an architectural metaphor. It's when the world was founded, established on its bases. In Job chapter 37, it is not a dead metaphor. God says to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line out upon it? On what, what were its bases sunk? And who laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy? The world is a building. Portrayed that way, the vivid building metaphor. Or take another... It's a, a, by, by a passing statement by God in Isaiah 45. This is what's called the self-introductory formula of a prophetic oracle. You might get something like, I am the Lord who delivered you out of bondage, now listen to me. But this doesn't say delivered out of bondage. This is what it says in verse 18. But thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He didn't create it a chaos, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none other. That's Genesis 1. The world is an inhabitable place. A habitable place. Okay. In Genesis 1, the divine craftsman or artist who has constructed a beautiful world, a beautiful building, is pleased with each stage of the creative process. And so six times you are told, God looked at what he had made and saw that it was good. The artist is saying, did a good job there. Let's move to the next step. That was really well made. Let's move to the next step. At the end, the final product, God looked at the whole shebang and it was amazing. That's my paraphrase of 131. It's an artistic metaphor at this point. But what kind of building did God make? Hint, 
All creation worships God. Psalm 148. A very beautiful creation psalm. At the beginning of the psalm, all hev- heavenly creatures are called upon to worship the Lord. Praise Him. Angels, His host, the sun, the moon, the stars, the highest heavens, and the waters above the heavens. That ancient world picture, which we don't know what that means. All the heavenly creatures praise the Lord. And then from the earth, praise Him. Sea monsters, all deeps, fire, hail, snow, frost, stormy wind, fulfilling His command. Mountains, hills, fruit trees, cedars, wild animals, cattle, creeping things, flying birds. Oh yeah, people too. The whole creation is to praise the Lord in worship. Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Or Psalm 29, a nature psalm, a storm comes from off the sea across Israel and breaks trees down and causes wild animals to give birth. And the Lord rides upon the storm and all in his temple say, holy. What temple are we talking about? It's the forest creatures we're talking about. They're amazed by the holiness of God. The world is his temple. That's the kind of building we're talking about. So Isaiah 66, the same Isaiah who saw the Lord high and lifted up and the, the train of his robe filled the temple. That's a picture. That's, you know, the Jerusalem temple has the Holy of Holies. And there you have in the Holy of Holies the Ark of the Covenant. The picture is the Ark of the Covenant has a, a seat and there are two cherubim carved in gold on either side. And it's thought God sits upon the seat. Invisible. No idol. No image. An invisible God dwells in the midst of Jerusalem there. So this prophet Isaiah goes into a corrupt Jerusalem and says, I saw the Lord in the temple. But only the the hem of his pant filled the entire temple. Because he was magnificent. Because, as Isaiah 66 says, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Picture that. You can't contain me in the Jerusalem temple. So then God says, what is this house that you want to build it for me? Why are you building a temple? I I don't need a temple made by human hands. I already have a temple. It's called the cosmos and I created it with my own hand. Why would God make the world a temple? Well, here's an interesting little picture which I got from a book. And any book that tries to picture the world picture of Genesis 1 will give you some version of this. They're all a little bit different because they're not systematic. Just a picture. Above the heavens sits God on his throne. You can imagine his foot coming down and stepping on the, on the earth. Now, when the tabernacle was completed in the book of Exodus, chapter 40, we are told that the Spirit of God the glory of God, which later Jewish tradition called the Shekinah, entered the temple and filled it. Entered the tabernacle and filled it. Because what God wants to do is to permeate this worship space with his presence so every creature can experience him. However, in Genesis 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. But when God made the world, the Spirit did not automatically fill creation. Why? If you understand the theology of images, you understand that the Spirit of God was to fill the created order through His image, which is how it was thought a God filled a temple was through His image. What's the image that God puts in the earthly temple? Turn the page. Or let's go to page 5. It's human beings. We have the task of mediating the presence of God in the world. So I want to address first of all the role of human beings as cultural beings. All creatures are called to worship God, but humans are called to worship God in a particular way, by being human. I really mean that. The stars worship God by being stars. The mountains by being mountains. Humans by, not singing songs of praise, by being human. Part of which is to sing songs of praise. It's only a part by using our God-given power to transform the earth into a complex civilization that glorifies God, which includes families, cities, governments, technology, art, education, science, churches, etc. All of human life is meant to be a transformation of this world that God might inhabit it by his spirit, that it might be filled with his glory. Now, who here has ever grew up on a farm? You know about growing crops and raising animals, right? 
kind of dirty, sort of, but it's the basis of all human civilization. Modern people who are very urban have forgotten this, that culture and civilization cannot function without agriculture and animal husbandry. It's the ground of all civilization. So we have, when God puts human beings in the garden in Genesis 2, 15, their purpose, their task is to work the garden and take care of it. Agriculture is the fundamental human purpose. Or in Psalm 104, there are three or four times when humans are mentioned in Psalm 104, and every time they're mentioned, their work or labor is mentioned. That's what's distinctive about them. In particular, there's one place where it says, and when the night comes, the, the lions go out hunting. When the morning comes, the humans go out to work. Lions do their thing, humans do their thing. Work, labor. Nothing wrong with that. That's our God-given purpose. Or, in verses 14 and 15, it says, you cause the grass to grow for cattle. They just kind of eat it. But, you give plants to people to bring forth produce from the earth. And what do they bring forth? Wine, bread, and oil. They're not satisfied with grapes, wheat, and olives. We've got to do something with it and make it really nice. Humans transform the world by their labor. And that's good. That's celebrated in Psalm 104. Or Psalm 8. Speaks about, you know, God, you're amazing. You've put your signature in the universe. But what is these people on earth, these human beings, that you care so much for them, that you've elevated them to a status of rule over all the realms of animal life? That's what is unique about human beings. Animal husbandry. Agriculture and animal husbandry. Using power to grow things, to transform the world. Of course, you can't have a complex civilization if you haven't settled down and grow things. Hunter-gatherers can't have a complex civilization. You've got to actually be growing stuff. We know that. Most of us have forgotten that. The foundation of all civilization. Now, Genesis 1, 26 and 28 combines all of this. It combines rule over animals, dominion over the, the beasts of the field and all this stuff, with subduing the earth, which is the agricultural part, the growing of crops. That's the human purpose. And Genesis 1 tells us that the human purpose of taking care of animals and growing things on the ground, taking control of the land, is what it means to image God. God's going to make us in his image so we can do these things. This means we have to understand the notion of imago dei. You can learn a nice Latin phrase there, imago dei. We can just say image of God. Without an understanding of the ancient Near Eastern background, we won't grasp that concept. In both Egypt and Mesopotamia, the image of a god was either the cult statue in a temple, which we call a graven image, right? Or it was a king. Kings were called the image of Marduk or Shamash or Amon Re, one of the, the chief gods in both Mesopotamia and Egypt. And images were thought, whether it's a cult statue in a temple or a king, were thought to mediate and channel the presence and power of God to the people. Image is a mediator. It's a priestly function. So when the king walks by, you bow. Because there's something glorious about him. Something shining. In fact, we have these texts of the ancient and recent kings on the field of battle. And the glory and radiance that goes forth from them demolishes their enemies. You ever seen anybody with that much glory? And we try to put the halo around Jesus in the medieval pictures to get the same idea. That's what humans are supposed to have. The glory of God shining through them. Now, in contrast to the king and the royal elites, the mass of humanity in the Mesopotamian cultures were defined by servitude. Mesopotamian creation myths, and I've listed Enuma Elish, Atrahasis, and Enki and Nima. We can list a whole other bunch of them. They all say in different ways, humans were created to serve the gods by doing dirty work the gods were tired of doing. And that specifically meant building temples to house the gods, because they're like the king, Build me a palace, you know, that's the temple, and make sure you keep it up, you know, and pay for it, and feed the gods, bring sacrifices. How are you going to bring sacrifices? You've got to grow crops, and the crops go to the temple. Of course, the priests eat it, and the king eats it in the end, but it's really for the, you know, the god to eat, right? So that's the rationale for the whole temple system and the whole monarchy, because the king is the high priest over all the gods. 
So all these serfs, sometimes two-thirds of the population, were in servitude to the land to grow crops and dig irrigation canals so they could feed the gods. That was the rationale. So these creation myths that put humans down, we did dirty work, labor, it was so the gods could rest. That's what they said, so the gods could rest at ease in their palaces and temples. And of course, it justified the entire economic social system of Mesopotamia. It, it justified it for about 2,000 years. Very powerful creation myth. The Bible, however, has a distinctive vision. Living in that culture, and if you lived in ancient times, as in biblical times, you would know the Mesopotamian worldview so well. It's like somebody in South America. They know about America. It's like Kenyans want to vote for Barack Obama and think he's going to fix their problems back in Kenya. I mean, everybody knew Mesopotamia. It was the universal culture of the day. The Bible says, though, there's only really one true God, not multiple gods, and he is not imaged by cult statues. Only humans are the legitimate image of God on earth. But beyond that, all people, not just kings, are God's image on earth. There is a dem democratic impulse in the Bible. It took a long time to get worked out, but it's fundamentally there. In the New Testament, we talk about that as the priesthood of the believer. That's grounded in being the image of God. All people mediate the presence of God through their access to God. Humans, then, are called to a task of royal dignity, not to do the dirty work of the lower gods, as in Mesopotamia. We have been commissioned to develop culture and civilization, which was seen to be the province of the king in the ancient world. So do you know the Gilgamesh epic, where Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, boasts in the beginning of the story, I, Gilgamesh, you know, two-thirds God, one-third man, pretty, pretty nifty if you can work that out, I build all these building projects, I create all this culture, aren't I great? By this I manifest the gods on earth. Okay? Democratize in the Bible. All human beings have this task. So when God rests on the seventh day, it is because he has entrusted rule of the earth to human beings. When you delegate power to a co-worker or somebody that's under you, and you really trust them, you don't want to micromanage, you step back and let them do it. That's what God does. In the Bible, all of human history occurs on the seventh day. The day of God's rest. It does not say the day of human rest, by the way. That's a later development in the Bible, where the Sabbath is modeled on that. God rests because he has given us great dignity and power. He is not abdicating from a burdensome task, like in the Mesopotamian myths. There is a different interpretation of God's rest. Now, Israel's role among the nations was that they were originally to be the royal priestly mediators of the presence of God to the world. One of the reasons why Israel was told you should have no king. Israel is the only nation in the ancient Near East that did not start out with a monarchy. Did you know that? Radical, different sort of social order. Israel only received a king in the ninth century when they asked Samuel for a king so we can be like the nations, keep up with the Joneses. And God said initially, bad idea. And he explained why. The king will oppress you with his power and you become his servants. Just like what happened in the ancient world. They didn't agree. And he said, okay, here's the keys to the car, but here's some rules if you want to take it. And he gives some limits on what the king can do. And of course, all the kings overstep the limits. But Israel was to be a priestly kingdom or a royal priesthood. Abraham and his offspring were to bring blessing to all the nations of the world. That was their purpose. And that's, of course, grounded in being human, the image of God. Which is why the Bible shows a very unusual interest in the cultural development of the earth by ordinary human beings, not just by kings. You know the way that we write history. We focus on all the leaders, right? What the leaders do in history. That's what the ancient people did too. But the Bible tells us about the first city built by a man, not a king. The only city, the only first city in any nation's origin text that says the first city wasn't built by a god or a king is the Bible. Built by an ordinary human being. Then the Bible shows interest in the origin of livestock herding, musical instruments, and metal tools. Why? Because they're utilizing the image of God, the cultural power God has given them. Even early worship practices, Cain and Abel bring offerings to God based on agriculture and animal husbandry. Interesting. God didn't tell them what to do. They just invented that. Or Genesis 4.26. That time people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Never did that before. 
Let's try that for a change. Call on the name Yahweh. Pray in that. that you know, telling us about developments. A lot of sinful developments too, by the way, because this is after the fall. But anyway, some good things happen. Okay. I've, done, I've sketched a little bit about background ideas in the rest of the Bible and in the ancient Near East that help us to read Genesis 1 as the construction of a cosmic sanctuary, a temple in which we are called to worship God by our use of power in this world, which has been delegated by God to us. I want to now nuance that by looking at another overlapping world picture, that is of God's kingdom, God's covenantal kingdom. And this is not the pattern of the panels, now it's going to be the pattern of the fiat, let there be, which in Latin is fiat. So let there be light is fiat lux. In Hebrew it is yihi or. A little different than fiat lux. I call them the yihi patterns, but you won't understand. God as king in the Old Testament is typically a description of God as savior of Israel in the Psalms and in the prophetic literature. God as king is the God who fights on behalf of Israel, like at the Red Sea crossing. He's now become my salvation. The Lord will reign forever and ever. But God as king is also described as the God as king of creation, the God who rules the world, like in Psalm 93 or 95. The Lord is king, let the nations rejoice. The world is firmly established because Yahweh reigns. He rules creation. And therefore all the earth should worship him. So you're getting a blending of the worship temple metaphor and the kingdom metaphor. They overlap now. King and covenant are also tied together because in the book of Deuteronomy, God is described as the great king over Israel and he makes a covenant with Israel. In the ancient world, covenants were made by kings with conquered peoples. A covenant is a form of political administration and God enters into covenant with Israel as their king and then he gives them his, their decrees and laws that they are to obey. The first one is this, no treason, treason will be punished. That's what they, the first thing in every covenant is. In the Bible it's called, uh, don't worship any other gods before me. Same basic idea, allegiance to this God, obey his commands. Covenant language, though typically used in the Bible of the covenant with Abraham, David, Israel, and the New Covenant and the New Testament is actually used in Genesis 9 after the flood for God's covenant with all living things and with the earth itself. God is the king even of the world, entering into a bond with the world to pledge I'll never again wipe it out by flood. He promises the earth. Ah, come on, that's just poetry, right? He promises the earth. God makes a pledge in the book of Jeremiah to restore Israel and the line of David after the exile. And he says that pledge is just as sure as the covenant I made with day and night and the laws of heaven and earth that I have established. There's an analogy between God's relationship to Israel and to the non-human world. God is in a covenantal relationship of bond. By his word, by his law, by his deed, by his decree, his ordinance, his statute. So along with wisdom, by which he created, we found that in Proverbs, we have covenantal terms like word, command, decree, used of God, bringing creation into being. Let's take a look first at Psalm 33. For the, um, I'm looking at verses 69. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, summarizing Genesis 1, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. Is that the spirit? Same word, ruach. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deeps in storehouses. That's, you know, bounding the waters with the land and the firmament. Just a little more poetic, perhaps. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. That's covenantal language. Commands. Torah. God gives Torah to the world. You can find similar la language in Psalm 148, 5 and 6. But I'm going to think about Jeremiah 10 as an example, which blends together the language both of wisdom and of word. It was God who made the earth by his power, who established the earth by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, literally when he speaks his word, there's a tumult of waters in the heavens and he makes mist rise from the ends of the earth. God relates to the created order by wisdom and by word. They're overlapping metaphors 
the, the construction of the building, the architectural metaphor, and the commanding king. They're blended together. Now, I'm, I'm paying attention to the world, world picture because it's only through the world picture we can understand the theological claims of the text being made. Psalm 147 is a fascinating psalm that in each of its three stanzas intertwines one, what God does for people, and what, two, what God does for what we call nature. In the third stanza, he first says, God sends his word, and snow falls, and ice forms. It's called winter. God told it to happen. Then God sends his word, and things start to thaw, and waters run again. It's called spring. The word of God affects that. And the very next line, and he has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws to the people of Israel. God relates to the human and the non-human by his word. He's the God who gives directives for how the world should function because he's the God who made the world. His wisdom is embedded in this world. And if you want to live in harmony with the world, with creation, then you go with the grain of the universe. If you want to stand against the way God made things to be, things get royally screwed up. Royally, because we're made in God's royal image, of course, but royally screwed up. Psalm 119 even says that in response to God's creative word, quote, all things are your servants. Because the king says, go here, do that. Yes, sir, you, fall, you do what the king says. You're the king's servants. All things, every creature is responding to the creative word of God just by existing. So the world is a series of servants of the Most High God in his temple, waiting on him hand and foot to do what he wants. So the fiat pattern in Genesis, let there be, and there was, and God saw that it was good, is actually the same pattern as the kingdom of God, or the covenant. For in the covenant and in the kingdom, the king gives decrees for how we should live. We respond, hopefully in obedience, that's the left side of the chart, that shows our wisdom, or in folly, we go against God and disobey. That hasn't happened in Genesis 1 yet, that's Genesis 3, right? And in response, God evaluates what we do. In the, in the covenant, we have what's called the covenant sanctions, the blessings and curses. If you do what the Lord requires, you'll be blessed in the field, in the house, with fertility, with long life, with many children. You won't go into exile. You don't do what God wants, all the bad stuff's going to happen to you. God evaluates the human response to his law. Let there be is equivalent to the Torah. And it was so is the creature coming into obedient existence. And God saw that it was good is God's evaluation, that things are going well at this point. Only lasted two chapters, then it went downhill very fast. Key point here is, life is religion. Just as life is worship. Every creature is called to worship God, and in everything we do, we are responding to the Torah of God for the created order. We might call that natural law. That's a couple. Let's use a theological term. The Torah of God for human life. The instruction, the directions, the decrees. So, if we follow this image of the kingdom now, in Genesis 1, the divine ruler is pleased with the obedience of the creature to his will at each stage of creation. So he says, it was good. So the good there is not just the artist being pleased with the outcome of the work, it's now the king being pleased with the obedience of the creature. Which one is true? They're both true in these overlapping metaphors. And in the end, God saw everything he had made. It was very good. The world was perfect the way God meant it to be. This understanding of creation as good, as fundamentally good, is unique in the history of the world. I go out on a limb. From my studies, there is no other religion or mythology, or philosophical point of view, except those depending on the Bible that claim the world is originally good. All other origin texts suggest there was evil at the beginning in some way. And that's clear in Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation story, where the god Marduk vanquishes Tiamat, which is simply the Akkadian word for ocean or deep water. She's the chaos monster. She's also the watery deep. And when he vanquishes her, he splits the waters and constructs heaven and earth out of her dead carcass. So creation is the result of a violent battle against 
primordial evil which is there at the beginning which resists the will of the gods. The Bible has none of that. No struggle. The world is very good. In fact, in verse 21, among the sea creatures that God creates are taninim, dragons, says the King James. It's a, it's a term used in the Baal myths of ancient Ugarit for the monster of chaos that God had to fight at the beginning. God created that. And Leviathan, another term for that monster. Psalm 104 says God formed Leviathan to play with in the water. So Jewish scholar John Levinson says, Leviathan is God's rubber ducky. <laughs> this God doesn't have to fight any primordial evil, but creation is instead good. Now in what is going to be perhaps the most shocking piece of all this, I want to look at how God's word calls us to obedience in all dimensions of life. And I've got to start with the, the Exodus text. It's found twice as a repetition, Exodus 31 and 35. It's about one Bezalel, or Bezalel, who, according to the text, chapter 35, verses 30 to 33, we're told, God singled this guy out and filled him with the Spirit of God and with all wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Filled him with the Spirit of God in these things and all knowledge in all kinds of crafts to devise artistic designs in gold and silver and bronze, to cut stones, to set them, to carve wood in every kind of craft because he was going to oversee the construction of a building, the tabernacle. Now, yeah, tabernacle is a religious building, so it doesn't quite count, but the point is he had to learn a lot of craftsmanship in physical things long before he was ever put to build the tabernacle and God filled him with the spirit to learn all this stuff so he could acquire wisdom the same kind of wisdom by which God made the universe Bezalel as the image of God on earth was imitating God's creative actions in his construction of a small scale world one particular building between Genesis 1-2 the spirit of God hovering over the waters and Exodus, where Bezalel is filled with the Spirit. There's only one other reference to the Spirit of God as a phrase in the Bible between those two. It's Joseph in Genesis 41, where the Egyptians recognize that God has filled Joseph with his Spirit and with wisdom so that he can make good judicial decisions about how to organize Israel as its second in command to prevent people from dying in a famine. He is organizing a household, a world, with wisdom and with the Spirit of God. Very secular task. Spirit of God fills you so you can be holy, right? That's what we learn from the New Testament, right? Spirit of God fills you so you can be holy. Joseph's holiness was shown in the way he organized resources so the famine wouldn't kill everybody. Take Moses, Exodus 18. Remember that famous episode where Jethro comes to him and says, you need to appoint some people to work with you because the job is too big for you. What was the job? Israelites came to Moses. We've got a problem. We've got a dispute. Moses talked it through. said, my decision is you shall do this. The text says that Moses was making known to them God's statutes and instructions. Now, he didn't receive any special revelation. The statutes and instructions are not revealed till two chapters later, chapter 20 of Exodus with the Ten Commandments. Prior to the law being given at Sinai, Moses, through his wise decision-making, is articulating God's statutes, God's Torah built into the creation order, the wisdom of God. He's discerning it. Common sense, you might say. Yeah, sanctified common sense. But maybe more radical than all of them is Isaiah 28. The farmer, the farmer, says Isaiah, when farmers plow and sow seed. They don't, sow, they don't keep plowing and plowing and plowing till everything is broken up. They plow just enough so they can put the seed in, the furrow, right? That's common sense. No, not quite common sense, because according to Isaiah 28, 26, they are well instructed, for God teaches them. Okay. How about when you thresh grain? You know, you break off the, the outer husk. 
But when you're threshing small things like cumin and so forth, you don't grind it over with a cartwheel until it's pulverized and nothing. You just go over it once and then you break it open. Right? You, you thresh according to how much threshing is needed. Common sense? Not according to verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. So the farmer's wise plowing techniques and threshing techniques he learned from God. Not in special revelation, just from trial and error, common sense, and that's the revelation of God. Because he's in touch with the wisdom of God built into the created order, which is built into Genesis 1. Though it's not as explicit there as here. But even if Israel doesn't pay attention to God's wisdom, even if Israel goes against God's will and ignores what God wants, it says, at least the migrating birds know the will of the Lord. They are, they are portrayed in Jeremiah 8 as observant Torah keepers. The people go against the law, but the birds keep the law because they are migrating where they are supposed to migrate. Instinct, we'd say. We frame that theologically. They are obedient to God. They respond to God's word. So we live in a world that is embedded with the wisdom of God and that exists in response to the law of God, God's decrees and instructions for life. Life is religion. The way we use power is a response to God. Now, I've said a lot about texts outside Genesis 1. Shouldn't I be saying a little more about what's inside Genesis 1? I don't hear much of a yes. Okay. So, I want to focus now on what Genesis, the, the twist, the nuance Genesis 1 puts on these world pictures. That's a little bit different. The first is that not one of God's words for creatures to exist is in the form of a Hebrew imperative or command. Not one. Even though things like Psalm 33 said, that God spoke and he commanded and it stood firm, the text actually has what's called jussives, translated as let there be. And the jussive is much softer than an imperative. If I say, get me some water, that's an imperative. If I say, would you get me some water? That's a question. If I say, please get me some water, that's perhaps a jussive. Jussives are a request or an invitation or an encouragement for someone to do something. It's, it's interesting that this text uses this form of language. Why? I, I don't know why. I can't get into the mind of the author. But what is the effect of thinking about how God uses creational power? That he doesn't have to be coercive. He can simply invite things to be. And yes, sir, they jump to attention, and they are. More than that, God invites the earth or land, you can translate it either way, Eretz, on both days 3 and 6, and the waters on day 5, to participate in another act of creation, to take it one step further. He says to the land, let the land bring forth vegetation. Later, let the land bring forth living creatures. And let the waters teem with all kinds of sea creatures. And let the fowl fly in the air above. Now, God seems to want to share power with creatures, even creative power. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not going in the direction of Gaia theology or anything like that, but God is asking for the creature whom he has brought into being to participate in the next step of creation. What kind of a, a ruler is that? Not an autocrat. Not quite a democrat either. One wants us to come along and participate in the glories of creation. These are non-human creatures. Ah, just poetry, Middleton, come on. We're scientific people. We can't believe this kind of stuff. Now, in, on day three, the land responds to God's invitation. On days five and six, they don't. Land and waters don't. Maybe they're not able to bring forth living animate beings, but the land bring forth, brings forth vegetation. When the land brings forth vegetation, it's actually part of a pattern that we find, and I think it's easier to understand the pattern by looking first at the, the heaven or the firmament and the luminaries or the, the sun and moon. Because when God says, let there be a firmament, he says, to separate the waters above from the waters below. The point of the firmament is to divide things, 
Now, on days one, two, and three, God's primary mode of creation is dividing and separating. So the firmament, or the sky, is meant to do something God-like. It is also sort of in the image of God. Shh, I didn't say that. Because only humans are in the image of God, right? But it's got a task to do that's similar to God's own task. And when God puts the stars and the sun and moon in the sky, he says they are to separate day from night and light from darkness. They are also to do this kind of separating task, which is God's creative mode of operation on days one through three. There's an analogy or a likeness between the firmament and the luminaries on the one hand, and God's acts of separation. When you come to the land on day three, or the earth that brings forth vegetation, that's more like God's acts of filling on days four, five, six, where he fills the sky with luminaries, he fills the air with birds, he fills the waters with fish, he fills the land with land animals and humans. The, the earth brings forth vegetation to fill the whole land it's kind of like what God did, except there's one twist. The earth did it before God did it. So the earth is not actually imitating God at all. The earth at this point has no model to follow. There's a sense in which we could say the earth is not Im imago dei, but God's acts of filling on days four through six are imago mundi. Yeah, I'm getting heretical there, I shouldn't say that. If you are in charge of a business and you delegate to a co-worker to do something and they do it and they do it really well, what kind of boss are you if you get upset at that and you're threatened by that? God's not threatened by the earth bringing forth vegetation before God fills any of the regions with anything. That's an amazing God. Kind of like the God I worship, that we know from the New Testament. Maybe not too much difference here. One more piece. This is maybe not as interesting. It would take more time to get into, but the fiat pattern of let there be, and it was so, and God saw that it was good, and then there's a, another piece usually, and then God made something or did something after. The, and then that pattern, which you find in the first act of creation, the creation of light, in that order, one, two, three, four, doesn't follow that order any more after that. The order is mixed up. The order of events is variable. And sometimes, one of the pieces is missing from the order. Anytime you see an X there, the order is missing. Anytime you see an A or a B, there's some ex extra diversity about the way that functions. The, the patterning of creation is not overdetermined by God in advance. The patterning, the rhetorical patterning of this narrative, I think is meant to convey something of the way creation actually operates. God does not rule creation with an iron fist. God calls creation into being, and the creature comes into being with a certain amount of flexibility that meets what God requires. I think there are implications there for understanding the development of the universe. Throw that out for your thoughts. There are even more variations. I, in my book, Liberating Image, I have a whole section talking about sub-variations within variations, and it starts to get really tedious after a while, so I, I, I call it off, but it's a very complex text, a text that looks like it's very ordered, but it's very flexible in its ordering, and the order is non-deterministic, which I think is kind of like fractal geometry, actually. And I know that the authors of Genesis don't have, know anything about fractal geometry. Maybe fractal geometry is modeling something about the real world that is actually seen in Genesis. So if I had a nice website, I'd take you to an interactive version of the Mandelbrot set and show you that you click on any piece of that diagram and you enlarge it. And it's got equal levels of complexity no matter how deep you go. Now that particular diagram, at level 15, it stops because they couldn't put any more data in there. But the world is fractal the edge of a leaf, a coastline. The, more, the, the further you go down, magnify, the more complexity you have. You never reach a straight line. There's no Euclidean geometry in the world. It's fractal. It's kind of like the, the complex patterning and variations within variations I find in Genesis. Maybe it's just an analogy and I'm pushing it. So let me tell you my other metaphor. 
That is, I think the way God organizes the universe is less like a Newtonian lawgiver. Just notice this, by the way. Newtonian lawgiver, the model we have of God, like in Calvinism, right? That's, it basically comes from modern science. We take a scientific notion of ineluctable natural law, cause and effect universe, we transfer it onto God, we get predestination. We always use scientific models to do theology. Okay, let's use chaos theory. Let's say God is more like a strange attractor. If you know anything about how strange attractors work, a strange attractor is a stabilizing force in a complex system of variations that never repeat themselves, but they're in finite and closed space. This kind of, of chaos theory with strange attractors help us to do better prediction, for example, of the weather, of how neurons fire in the human brain, how a waterfall flows, because it doesn't flow in a deterministic way, but it has an order to it. I think that the way God functions in creation is kind of like a strange attractor. I'm just going to say kind of like, not pushing it too far. Okay, you can throw that out if you don't like that. But, my last point on this. God's use of power in Genesis 1 is the paradigm or model for human beings made in the image of God. Whose image are we made in? The creator. The creator who uses power for generosity, with invitation, uses power for blessing, for life. Jesus taught about this in Mark 10, where he said, you disciples, you're not to use power the way the kings of the Gentiles use it. They lord power over other people. But I have come among you like a serving man. I've come to be your servant, to give my life a ransom for many. That's your model for the use of power. You use power to bless others. Who didn't use it for his own benefit, but for us. That's actually rooted in creation, because that's the kind of world God brought into being. Who here has children? If you knew now what you knew, what you knew then what you know now, would you have had children? I don't answer that question. If God really knew in an existential way what would happen to the world he made, would he have brought it into being? This recalcitrant bunch of people who rebel against his will. Why would you bring into being an other, separate from yourself, that you're going to have to deal with that can resist you? Why would you do that? Certainly not for your benefit, but for their benefit. Creation is out of love. In both creation and redemption, God so loved the world that he gave. That's not just a New Testament teaching. That's rooted in Genesis. Or since it is one day after the 40th anniversary of Dr. King's death, we could use a phrase from his famous book, Strength to Love. Why do we have strength? Why do we have power? Why do we have privilege? It's to bring blessing and generosity. That's taught in the book of Genesis, in the creation account. Now, maybe I have not really addressed science yet, so let me make a few concluding statements. This is how I think the worldview of Genesis 1 addresses the scientific enterprise. One, it's a human task as the image of God to mediate the Creator's presence in earthly life. We're sort of like God's prism. Calvin said God's mirror, but that's reflecting back to God. That's not what we do. We reflect outward. We are missional. We refract his marvelous light into a rainbow of cultural activities that scintillate with his glory. Two, the practice of science is part of the cultural mandate to mediate God's presence in the world. Science, like all cultural practices, is world construction by which we image God the Creator. How would that transform your practice of science if you were aware of that? Third, Genesis 1 does not, I think, provide a normative cosmology, but it does provide a normative worldview. A worldview that's meant to undergird and guide all cognitive enterprises, including science. But we are the ones, as the scientists, who have to translate the enduring values of this worldview into our scientific work. It comes through the person who's done the hard work of, in my next point, being the mediator who takes the grounding worldview of scripture and translates it in practice into science. It has to come through people, not just individuals, but the body of Christ in science. That dimension of God's kingdom, God's church involved in the scientific enterprise, need to be communal about this. 
So finally, scientists need to be grounded in and formed by the Christian tradition. And the practice of science needs to be an aspect of lived discipleship. Part of our worship of God. All Christians, scientists included, are members of a community who are called to witness to God's purposes in the world in all they do, in all cultural pursuits, including the scientific enterprise. So if mountains worship God by being mountains, and stars worship God by being stars, how do scientists worship God? Being scientists. Human beings, however, can do better or worse in our response. What is what does it mean to be a good scientist, an obedient scientist, a worshipful scientist? It's not about going to church and worship and then being a scientist like everybody else. It's about allowing who you are, your identity, as a renewed image of God to transform your work. That will involve certain cognitive issues, but it's going to be much more than cognitive. It will affect things like, where do I accept funding from? What projects do I work on? Have I thought about the consequences of my science? These are all parts of Christian discipleship that are relevant to science. Okay. I'm going to stop now. Thanks very much.